All right. Hila came up with an excellent suggestion last time. And rather than assigning roles to people, we just keep rotating back and forth. And one time you may read one person, one time you may read another person. So we are at Act 2, Scene 1. We'll just read through Scene 1. Uh, we'll let Ron lead off. Uh, 27. Pompey, you're Pompey, and then he's Menecrates, and just keep going like that. No, no, you're up. No, come on. We're, no, we're going back and forth. <laughs> no, no, we no, no. We just keep each person. We keep changing. All right. All right, Rob, Mark, you're up. This is most certain that I shall deliver. Mark Anthony is every hour in Rome expected. Since he went from Egypt, tis a space for further travel. So really nicely. Okay, we're looking at this play as something of an intermezzo between major sub-series. We just finished Magic, and the next series is going to be a series on the theme of love and the law, and we're going to talk about cause and consequence and things like that. So we're not trying to have a major theme. Uh, we're not even going to look at a lot of deep philosophical issues unless they are incidental to the text. We're just going to pass through the text. And mostly what we're doing is character study. Astrological character study, psychological character study, 
a little bit of how the spirit plays in, and a very little bit of political uh, character study. Um, this scene is mostly to give us the history that is going on, but there is material in there that is interesting to us. If we look at the uh, character of Pompey, in, at least as it is given in this rendition, his character is very much like the character of Antony. He's a great spirit. He's a popular man. He's a man of honor. In his very first speech, he sounds almost like a Pollyanna, believing that everything is going to work out his way. It's, it's really a Jupiterian positivity. If the great gods be just, they shall assist the, uh, the uh, affairs of the justest men. So that's very uh, Jupiterian. For his first man, in the person of Menecrates, he seems to have chosen something of an opposite. Perhaps he figures that with his expansive character, he needs a first man to be with him that will balance him. Uh, Menecrates, as we can see in his speeches here, uh, appears to be more cunning and more ambitious, and he's more of a Saturnine figure. Maybe not quite so much as Caesar is in this play, but very clearly Saturnian anyway. Menecrates, by his suggestion, uh, carefully guides the conversation not into the high-blown statements of honor in things like that, but he brings it down to very practical matters of state, of which he seems to have a uh, uh, seems to have a very good grasp. In the statement at a, around line five, where he says, "We are ignorant of ourselves. We, ignorant of ourselves, beg often our harms." which the wise powers deny us for our good, so we profit by losing of our prayers. Well, that's a very, uh, it's based on a very uh, spiritual notion. We know for certain that our waking consciousness is just a little island, and that our whole being is much bigger than that little island. The unconscious, which is the sea that surrounds this island of consciousness, seems to be split level. First, there is a subconscious. And out of the subconscious, the lower nature works, and it works behind a veil of secrecy. We probably couldn't stand ourselves if we knew the depth and extent of our baser motivations. So we cooperate, we're complicit in this unconsciousness because there are things we don't want to face about ourselves because we would be too uncomfortable. Even though the lower nature is base and even though it is cunning, the uh, lower nature that is hid from our consciousness is not the most powerful part of our being. Our true spiritual nature, our divine being, or our selfhood, is the other level of the split level unconscious. Some call it the superconscious. It is hidden for, uh, from us for a much different reason. We have not yet sufficiently nurtured the spirit with the soul material from our experiences so that it can be fully awakened. And we haven't taken all the time and trouble and the change that is necessary to awaken the spirit in us. So it's unconscious and uh, it uh, has a lot of limits in that unconscious. Nonetheless, in that quasi-conscious state, it does do much more than we ever suspect to shape and to control our lives. It has divine intent, and it has a scope that exceeds 
our capacity to understand right now. It's very much like the words that Hamlet says when he says, there's a divinity that shapes our lives, rough hew them though we may. Now, as sly as the lower nature is, its desire and its ambition often cause it to exceed its own capacity and it brings about our downfall. In seeking more and more to satiate desire, it exceeds its own limitations and we have difficulties. Just like this passage says, we, we have all wanted things and have taken steps to get them only to find when we get them that they weren't what we wanted at all and there was much more involved than them than we ever wanted. Now we, you can ask yourself the question, why does the spiritual self allow this to happen? Because ultimately, all of our being is the domain of the spiritual self. Part of the reason is that a good deal of the functioning of our lower vehicles, especially the lower mind and the desire body, have been usurped by the lower nature. And it has grown fat and strong in satisfying its own desires. And to some extent, it appears that the self is not yet strong enough to completely take over. It doesn't have the moral muscle. And we can all say, like St. Paul says, the good that I would, I do not. But that which I would not, that do I. So it's... Uh, Something that, despite our better intentions, the lower nature often holds sway. Another reason for this is because the higher nature works in a different way. It works in the way of the spirit. It is universal. And the power of the spirit comes from its subtlety. And it doesn't have any panics. So when it works subtly from the universal, the way the spirit works almost seems indirect. It seems like it's coming from almost any place but ourselves. And because it's universal, it vastly subtends the realm of the desire nature and consequently it can uh, easily when it is in a position to do so, uh, control the desire nature. So it sometimes allows the desire nature and even encourages it to overstep itself. This is hinted at in scripture when it says, resist not evil. Thus we learn lessons by overstepping, by desiring too much, and having things come back to us at just the right time, in the right way, that humble us, and that humble our desire nature. So, it exposes the lower nature, and it makes it vulnerable, so that it will never do that again. This is often done in times that are most embarrassing to us, because the ego is always saving face, and it can't stand embarrassment. So the things that are called symptomatic actions or Freudian slips are when the spirit forces the desire nature to expose itself whether it likes to or not and inadvertently it does so. So it is a perfect uh, manifestation of that statement the wise shall be captured in their folly. And it is to something like this that Menecrates is alluding and he says that sometimes we want something and we better know what we want because we're going to get it and then we aren't going to want it. And that's when the desire nature is, uh, is overstepping its boundaries. Pompey continues on with his overconfidence 
And he certainly does. He's not only like Anthony, he sees himself in Anthony and Anthony in him. However, between Menecrates and Menas, uh, they both seem to have enough Saturnian uh, uh, nature in them to uh, keep him in line. All right, we are starting at scene two with Mark leading off. Your speech is passion, but pray you, stir no embers up. Here comes the noble Antony. Messinus. Hey, then. Would we all, would we had all such wives, that the men might go to wars with the women?
sort of know a bunch and are you doing that three things I had to at least do one and then I was not just one but the next day If it might please you to enforce no further the griefs between ye, to forget them quite, or to remember that the present need speaks to atone you. Thou hast a sister by thy mother's side, admired Octavia. Great Antony is now a widower. Short. Page 35. Hap 
simply, Amen. Noble Antony, not sickness should de- should detain me. There she appeared indeed, where my reporter devised well for her. Nerides. Okay. Thank you. 
beauty, wisdom, modesty can settle the heart of Antony. Octavia, a blessed lot is Octavia is a blessed lottery to him. Look a little bit at the uh, first man of Antony. He chose a much different kind of first man than Pompey. Antony has chosen a man who is like himself, and not a complement or a counterbalance or anything like that. However, in Eno Barbus, he certainly did not choose a yes man. Eno you know, Barbus is every bit as martial as Antony is, and probably even more so. He's impeccable in martial rigor. If you look at his first speeches, he challenges the general, Lepidus, who is one-third of the power of the world. He knows the advantage one gains if you take the initiative right away and you don't give quarter at all. He never lets up. It's attack attack, attack. He keeps on even when Caesar and Antony are there and Antony has to rein him in uh, because he's that martial. He's a, everything is a confrontational kind of thing. One of the things that we're looking at in this play is the interplay between Caesar and Antony. And this scene is very, very insightful in that interplay. We are looking at the two of them and their interactions as planetary opposites. Caesar is Saturn, and the planetary opposite of Saturn is Jupiter, and Antony is a Jupiter-Mars type of individual. You see this right away in the beginning when they first come in. You can see that there's a struggle going on. They play the game, who sits first? And eventually, they both have to sit at the same time. Antony, being bold, like Eno Barbus, brings up things immediately. He wants to clear the air. He doesn't want anything lingering. The Mars nature wants action, and it wants decisive action, and it wants it now. And so he goes on the offensive. Caesar seems to take the bait. He offers up in a way that it seems like he's just putting up petty complaints. They seem petty because that's how Antony treats them. He's, you know, he's got a big answer to every one of them that, you know, like, why are you taking offense at this? And uh, part of it is because this is the way Caesar addresses things. It seems petty, but it really isn't. Antony says to all of them, all of the uh, complaints that uh, Caesar issues, he says uh, he's above stuff like that. He was too busy in the botch. Caesar persists, and all of his things are little tiny factual statements, and they are designed to have a cumulative effect. First, he uh, accuses Antony and of making wars, and when that's rebuffed, he uh, chinks at Antony's armor, like around on page 32, uh, around page uh, lines 58 and 59, he says, you praise yourself by laying defects of judgments to me, but you patched up your excuses. So he's uh, now he's starting to take Antony on directly at this point. Then he goads Antony about his debauchery, his riotous living, which Antony is already aware of even before he leaves Egypt. He sees that he is undermining himself and he's undermining his stature in the world. And then finally, Caesar comes to the real cracker. He accuses Antony of breaking his oath. All of his statements are small, all of them are very pointed, and all of them are sitting 
on uh, some kind of fact. Now, this one, if you take a Mars-Jupiter person who is filled with pride, and you challenge them and say that they've broken their oath, this is really hard stuff. And it's successful. Because if you look at Antony in his reply, Antony falls for it, and he goes into Caesar's realm. That is the petty realm. And he's going to lose there. And so he gets petty, and he quibbles about the words uh, denied versus neglected. You know, he's getting down to petty things. He continues to be defensive. He confesses himself. He excuses himself. And he asks for pardon. Now, you know, Barbus doesn't like seeing this. And he has some sense of what's going on. And he doesn't like the whole business altogether. It's detracting from what is important. And what is important is making war. And he has a simple-minded martial nature. He doesn't care for all this petty talk. Antony tries to rein him in, but even when he's reined in, he's still uh, pretty hot in the things that he has to say. Uh, when he's reeled in, Caesar uses that occasion to take up the role of being hurt. Like, I've been harmed, and it all looks bad for me. And this, now that he's got Antony opened up, he can do this. And uh, Antony falls for it, and uh, thinking it's something that's easily done. When he, When Caesar says that he's hurt, and if there were some way that he could have something made up for him, that's the cue for Agrippa. Probably most of this whole scene was pre-planned. And then Agrippa seems to have this idea right on the spur of the moment, wouldn't it be nice if Antony married Caesar's sister Octavia, and then they would be bound together in love, and they would be bound together politically, and she would make an excellent wife. And it's done in such a way that it makes Antony feel as if by doing it, he can regain his honor and he can look the gentleman. It would be like a bourgesta for him. Anthony falls for it, and he thinks it's a really small thing for him to do. He's still smarting from the embarrassment of various different kinds, and uh, the little things that Caesar has said throughout the entire conversation have been very pointed, and they have really opened him up, and they've each one made their mark. Planets represent specializations or specialized functions or organs in the organism of God. And when there is specialization, there is both strength and weakness. And usually the same place where there is strength, there is also weakness. In Obarbus has shown us that uh, Marshall's specialty of attacking, of always presenting your face to someone. We call it now being in someone's face. And it's immediate and it's perpetual. However, if you are immediately in someone's face and you're listening and you're living in that instant, one loses a sense of time. Antony is martial enough so that he doesn't realize that in the struggle of the moment of trying to appear the big man and keep his pride when he has lost face, he doesn't have a sense of time. And he doesn't realize that this whole thing has been rehearsed by Caesar and Agrippa. He thought it was all settled beforehand. You know, he had written letters and he explained everything and he thought it was all over. He doesn't reckon in terms of a deliberation of time. Caesar is Saturnian and Saturn 
loves time. Caesar draws his attention to the petty little things and Antony in his bigness follows him. Now it's one of those things that if you listen to a multi-voiced piece of music, you can't hear the whole piece of music and each of the little parts at the same time. So once Caesar gets Antony down to little particulars, Antony is weakened because he loses the big picture. So Caesar has drawn him into his realm, and that realm is details. And for Antony, the devil is in the details because he wants only that big picture. Once the die has been cast, you know, Barbus he is easily disarmed from fanning the flames even more. Like when this whole business is over and uh, it's settled by marriage, then Enobarbus gets distracted into something that martial types like as much as they like making war. And that is swaggering and bragging. So Agrippa cons him into telling war stories. And by war stories, we mean not only the war, but the battle of the sexes. And that's very, very uh, rare for... Uh, uh, that's 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 very, very dear for martial types of people. All of what is said at the end of the play is history about the uh, gold-proud boat and the perfume and the eunuchs and everything uh, doing the paddling. It's apocryphal history, and some historians don't take it as true. Uh, in fact, if you look at the notes in the uh, early part of the book, before the play starts, you can find the historical sources where they tell about this with the purple sail and the whole business. She had to be regal. She had to have that taste for that rich purple color. All right. Let's read the next scene. Ah, uh, 40. Who's up? I see it in my motion, have it not in my tongue, but yet hie you to Egypt again.
Jupiter in Pisces in abstract indicates the, the symbols one can use to delve into alcoholism. Jupiter rules the abstract or the ideational mind. The higher mind or the ideational mind is also the location or the seat of the human spirit. It is the base of the threefold spirit. And that human spirit is reflectively projected into the desire body. So there is an intimate connection between them. And it works out your body is excited by alcohol, it becomes intensely active. And in that intense activity, it arrogates control of our being away from the human spirit. The effect of this is that the spirit is paralyzed almost. And it's powerless. And in this powerlessness, it is described by alcoholics, especially in Alcoholics Anonymous, as the alcoholic is powerless and must give itself over to a higher power beyond self. When the human spirit is not engaged because its position has been usurped by the desire body excited by alcohol, it's isolated and it's suspended in itself. And it's sort of like floating in a false idealism. Now this is one of the negative descriptions of Jupiter and Pisces. There are many other descriptions of Jupiter and Pisces, some of which are very positive. So, this floating in universal spirit, but being disengaged and powerless, it has a quality of a false optimism. It's a kind of feel-good positivity, which is exactly like Antony's statement to Cleopatra. He says, I'm going to be on the straight and narrow which is something every alcoholic has said at least a dozen times in life. When they're sobering up and they say, I'm going to live on the straight and narrow, they have that false kind of idealism. Now, Antony is not alcoholic, but he is a Jupiterian, and in revels of desire, he has himself out of control. Not so much that he's paralyzed, but the same symptom is there. He's sober, and his soberness he has the sentimental remorse. And uh, also associated with that is a kind of overconfidence. Anytime you have to say it, you probably aren't there yet. If you have to say, I'm sober and I'm never doing this again, you've probably said too much already. Now what happens between Antony and the soothsayer is very, very unusual. The idea is that in matters both within control and things out of control, like matters of chance, Caesar is going to dominate Antony. We've already seen one example of it. In the last scene in the conversation where control is all important, uh, Caesar's gotten the best of it. This doesn't mean that Saturn is always going to win over Jupiter. But if Jupiter is going to be dominated, it will be most easily done by a Saturnian individual. This is the way planetary opposites work. Jupiter and Saturn are planetary opposites, and they are both the best antidotes for each other and the strongest poisons for each other, depending on how they're used. That's also how planetary opposites works. Sometimes Saturn dominates Jupiter, and sometimes Jupiter dominates Saturn. When I first started studying mysticism many years ago, and before my whole life had been transformed by it, 
I used to hang around in the brothel areas just across the border in Mexico with my best friend, and we were both studying mysticism together. And we were both keenly aware of the principle of cause and consequence. We realized that within manifestation, it was a closed system. Grace can be injected, but in manifestation, it's a closed system and it's all-encompassing. And this knowledge, we tried to apply with great rigor, complete rigor. We tried to have it on our minds all the time, which is not a bad idea. When we played pool, which we frequently did, we didn't relax when we weren't shooting. We concentrated just as hard as when we were shooting, when it was our turn. When one was shooting, one was applying direct control, and otherwise, one was applying some kind of indirect control. We realized there were no accidents, therefore there were no lucky shots, which people call slop shots. Uh, <laughs> uh, so one's vigil of attentiveness was to be applied at all time. And if you lost, it wasn't only because you had less skill. It may have been because you just weren't holding your attention on the whole gestalt and you were losing because you had indirect contention, uh, indirect control of the attention. Because what you lack in skill, sometimes you can make up for it in... Uh, broader attention if you're really good at it. Sometimes we are masters over others by direct direct control. What Caesar did to Antony in the last scene was by direct control. He controlled the argument even though Antony was on the offensive because he had points of fact of little things. Sometimes superiority comes from indirect control and one isn't necessarily always in control of it or one is not aware of it. There doesn't appear to be any evidence of it whether it's all direct control or indirect control but it's pretty clear that the whole gestalt of things whether they're playing dice or fighting cocks or whatever they're doing Caesar has this control of the bigger picture. It's an indirect control and he has something that he believes in. And for that reason, he dominates Antony. So what the soothsayer is saying is a truth. There are some people that when you get around them, it's like the whole aura of them befuddles you. Some people try to build it up by hoopla, but sometimes it is just the uh, universality of their character that does it. Beyond that, there's something else that's going on as far as Saturn and Jupiter are concerned. There are periods in history, and those different periods in history also have flavors, and those flavors are, are planetary. At the time that this is occurring, there, you know, there are all of these civil wars. This is the second of which that we're looking into. And after the civil wars, the Roman Empire becomes very stable. It also doesn't continue to grow. So during the growing stage, when it's constantly expanding its borders, it's Jupiterian. But when it's consolidating and it is setting its form that it's going to hold for many centuries, then it is Saturnian. It's becoming a mature society, a Saturnine society. Mars, and to some extent Jupiter, and surely Uranus are youthful planets. They are there in the pioneering stages 
They are there in the expansive stages and they are especially there in the early stages of society. Planets like Pluto and Saturn are sober planets. They're much more mature and they, ha they exercise a cold, controlling influence over society. Revolutions are fomented and fought by the Trotskys and the Lenins. But when the revolutions are all over and a stable society is wanted, then the Saturnians come in. It's always the uh, Stalins and the Mao Zedongs that have this cold, quiet control in the Saturnian aged stage of a society. And so we can see that in the Jupiter-Saturn battle between Antony and uh, uh, Caesar, even though Antony is a very great man, his kind of man is going out of harmony with the direction of the cycle of the time of the Roman Empire. So it isn't going to work. All right. Roz is up. Forty-two. Your way is shorter. My purpose is draw me much about. You'll win two days upon me. Sir, good, sir, sir, good success. <laughs> not a whole lot that, that we can say of here is not uh, any particular meaning. It's just meant to uh, set the time and keep the history going. Uh, I don't know whether... Uh, Shakespeare's trying to make a point about Lepidus having to go around or about way or whether he makes things hard for himself. Uh, very often alcoholic types of people are always ones that choose the difficult way. I don't know. So let's just move on to the uh, next scene. Give us some music. Twas merry when you wagered on your angling, when your diver did hang a salt fish upon his hook, which he which with fervency drew up. That time, O oh times, I laughed him out of patience, and that night I laughed him into patience, and next morn, ere the ninth hour, I drunk him to his bed, and put my tires and mantles on him whilst I wore his sword to lift him. Oh, from Italy, Ram, thou thy fruitful tidings in my ears, that long time have been barren. Madam, madam, Antonio is dead. If they say so, then thou so yield them. There is gold, and hear my blessed veins to kiss, a hand that kings have licked in trembled kiss. First, madam, your belt. Why is no gold? Sarah, 
Madam, he's well. Well said. And friends with Caesar. Our honest man. Caesar and he are greater friends than ever. Take the approach in some way. But yet, Madam. I do not like, but yet, it does allay the good impression. Why, um, but yet, but yet, it is as a jailer. For the best turn in the bed. I tell Charmaine. Venom is made to a figure. The most infectious pestilence upon them. But madam, patient, what say you? Thanks, horrible villain. For I'll spread mine eyes like those of Charmaine. On my bed, my head. That shall be whipped through the wire and seen and dry. Slopping in the living room. Gracious <laughs> <laughs> madam, I do think you made not the match. <laughs> Say it is not so a promise I would give thee. And make thy fortune proud. The blow of our hat shall make thy youth look a little bit gray. And I will think for thee what this implies thy loss in this day. Who's married, madam? No, thou hast lived, lived too long. <laughs> Nay, then I'll run. What mean you, madam? I have made no fault. Good madam, keep yourself within yourself. The man is innocent. Some innocent scape not thunderbolt. Melt Egypt into mine and kindly creatures. Turn all to serpents. Call the slave again, though I am mad. I will not bite him. Call. He is afraid to come. I will not hurt him. Lack nobility, a trifle meaner than myself. I myself have given myself too far. Suppose. Come hither, sir. Though it be honest, it is never good to bring bad news to the victor. Take you the grace's gracious message and host of tongue. Let all ill tidings tell themselves. <laughs> Than I do, and I'll again say yes. Very bad. The gods confound me. Thou always dead. Thou that found me dead. Should I lie, madam? Oh, I wouldst thou didst. So half my Egypt were submerged and made a cistern for scaled snakes. Go, get thee hence. Hadst thou Narcissus face. Narcissus in thy face, to me thou wouldst appear most ugly. He is married? I crave your highness pardon. He is married? <laughs> Take no offense that I would not offend you to punish me for what you make me do. Seems much unequal. He is married to Octavia. Oh, that his fault should make a name of thee. And I have not to the heart sure of. Report, report to Caesar, the teacher of 
Savior through you in the incarnation. Let him not be of color or hair, meaning your privilege. Let him forever go, let him start. Now, so we be able one way like a gorgeous. The other way, Tamari. Did you, Alexis, bring me word how to call Shield? You can read it, Father. But do not speak to me. Leave me to my children. It's a. Uh, obviously, she has her hopes way up. And she's living so much in her desire so much in her dream that she doesn't admit to reality. She has to be told many times over that Antony is married to Octavia and uh, she still doesn't want to believe it. Just a few minutes ago when we spoke about Inobarbus, we noted that with specialization, the strong point is often the weak point. So when we see Cleopatra with Antony, she has this unpredictable variety. She has a war chest of lovers' weapons that she can use against him with what is called her infinite variety. When she's without him, that happens to be her weakness. She doesn't know what to do with herself. She doesn't know whether she wants music or whether she wants billiards or whether she wants to go fishing. So the thing that is her strong point and that keeps Antony amused is uh, a weak point for her. It has her all spread out when he's not there. Without the object of her attention uh, as an anchor and as a pole for her to uh, have as a North Pole, she becomes confused in her many different uh, facets of being. Now what happens when the messenger comes is a very fascinating thing. Surely this isn't what Marshall McLuhan had in mind when he said the medium is the message because the, the messenger is very much different. However, the rage of Cleopatra does open up another side of her character and it gives us a chance to learn some astrology and psychology at about the same time. There are a number of different ways or reasons why people fall in love. One of the reasons for falling in love has to do with the limits of our character because our character development is very nascent. We're just beginners. And we're at the same time, we are deeply encumbered in matter. We can't do everything. At least until, not until we're as advanced as Leonardo da Vinci was. So what happens is, we work on some things for a while, maybe for several rebirths, and then we set them aside and pick up other things. We try to maintain balance as much as possible, but the deep materiality in which we are being reborn requires some kind of specialization. In fact, the material works best by specialization. The inner part of our character, the more spiritual part of it, is not solid like our skeleton. And it's not bone cold either. We have a longing to be whole and we have a longing to be complete. When part of our inner being is dormant in our unconscious being and to some extent even in our conscious being, we long for that part even though we may not always be cognizant of that longing. In that longing, we often look outward. We look for someone that is that. And then along 
becomes someone who is what we aren't. Someone who is manifest in the qualities in which we are dormant. We are attracted to that person and we feel whole with that person. We seem to need that person. We're not enough without that person. We are in love with that person as a long lost part of ourself. There are other ways and reasons that people fall in love, but in some part at least this is what has happened with Cleopatra. She is a specialist in Venus and she is a specialist in love. Now when lovers find each other in this manner, there are several ways that things can proceed. Unfortunately, the most common thing that happens is that each lover lets the partner be for them what they aren't in themselves. When that happens, you have a compartmentalized relationship. And the other person is always foreign as much as they are part of ourself. It's like a foreign completion rather than an internal completion. That kind of relationship usually continues until death or divorce or something ruptures it and then each individual is left where they were before with the same kind of emptiness. The better way to treat this kind of falling in love is to let the manifest qualities of the other person tick within us. That is, we find in ourselves what we see reflected in our partner. And through the partner, we draw that out of our being and we develop it. That's a much healthier kind of relationship. And it has no, nothing foreign about it. Now with Cleopatra, it appears that a little of each has occurred, which is usually the case. It's very rare that there's a, a, a pure type of anything. We have been looking at her so far as a purely Venusian character. To be that purely Venusian, the opposite has to, to some extent, be latent. And Mars is the opposite of Venus. So the love between Antony and Cleopatra is a classic falling in love between the two planets that make up love and passion, Mars and Venus. Manif uh, Antony as the manifest Mars has matched her manifest Venus. And they have both needed each other. Now apparently some of that martial nature of Antony has taken because when when he's gone she isn't completely lost and she isn't completely hollowed out and she has more of the Mars nearer to the surface of her being. She's not some meek coquette or something like that. However, since this is the only the beginning of the development of the Mars, the Mars that is brought to the surface from its undevelopment is a mean Mars. It's a primitive Mars. It's a savage Mars. It's not even as well developed as Enobarbus with all of his in-your-face kind of behavior. So her anger in this scene is not at all inconsistent with her Venusian nature. In fact, it is a very accurate psychological profile. It indicates precisely how she got to her Venusian nature and why she needed that balance. And this is not exceptional. It's part of the way 
any kind of extreme specialized character takes place. There are many, many different examples of it. For example, if you have somebody that is called a puer eternum, that is a perpetual youth, somebody who remains a little boy all of their life, if you look in that character somewhere, you are going to find a cranky old man that is the part that isn't the perpetual youth that was developed. I guess that's about as much as we want to say. Let's go on and read scene six. Let's see, who was up? Uh, Most meet that first we come to words, and therefore have we our purposes, uh, written our purposes before us sent, which if thou hast considered, let us know, if twill tie up thy discontented sword, and carry back to Sicily much tall youth, that else must perish here. To you all three, descenders alone of this great world, chief factors for the gods I do not know, wherefore my father Avengers want, having a son and friend since Julius Caesar, who at Philippi the good Brutus ghosted. There saw you laboring for him. Was what that moved tell Cassius to conspire, and what made all honored honest Roman Brutus, with the armed rest, courtiers of Butus freedom, to drench the capital, but that they would have one man but a man. As that is it, hath made me rig my navy at whose burden the angered ocean foams, with which I meant to scorch the ingratitude that despiteful Rome cast on my noble father. Speak with them. Thou canst not hear us, Pompey, with thy sails. We speak with thee at sea, and thou knowest how much we do account. And indeed thou dost for our country. My father's house, if he can build not for himself, he may live in Pompeii. Be pleased to tell us, for this is for the present. Have you taken off what you have sent to us? There's the point. Do not be entreated to our glory, but it is yours, he said. And what must follow? Our offer. <laughs> know then, I came before you here a man prepared to take this offer. But Mark Antony put me to some impatience. Though I lose the praise of, of it by telling, you must know when Caesar and your brother were at blows, your mother came to Sicily and did find her welcome friendly. I have heard of Pompey, and I and am well studied for a liberal thanks, which I do owe you. Let me have your hand. The beds in the east are soft, and thanks to you that call me time, timelier than on purpose hither, for I have gained by it. I saw you last as a change of mind, but I know not what thanks much virtue costs in my place, and in my bosom shall she never find to make me heart your best. Well, that's it. That I will, Pompey. No, Antony, take the lot. But first or last, your fine Egyptian cookery shall have the fame. I have heard that Julius Caesar grew fat with tasting there. You have heard much. I have fair means, sir. Fair works to them. Yet to so much have I heard. And I have heard from the Romans of Henry. Then what? 
Well, and well I am like to do, for I perceive four feasts are toward. Let me shake thy hand. I never hated thee. I have seen thee fight when I have envied thy behavior. Seventy-five. I never loved you much, but I have praised thee when you have well deserved ten times as much as I have said you get. Enjoy thy plainness. Nothing ill becomes thee. Aboard my gallery, I will invite you all. Will the way you towards? Show us the way, sir. And you by land. I will praise any man that will praise me. <laughs> Though it cannot be denied what I have done by land. Nor what I have done by water. <laughs> yes, something you can deny for your own safety. You have been a great thief by sea. And you by land. <laughs> then I can all by my service. You give me your hand, Nurse. If our eyes had authority, merely my all men say to him, true, whatsoever their hands are. But there is never a fair woman, I would you say. Well, slander against you, I have. We came hither to fight with you. For my part, I am sorry it's turned to a drinking. Pompey doth this day laugh away his fortune. If he do, sure he cannot weep back again. Sir, you look not for Mark Antony here. Pray you, is he married to Cleopatra? Caesar's sister is called Octavia. No, sir, she was married to Caius himself, but she was married to wife of Marcus Antonius. Pray you, sir? Yes, as Caesar and you have put the other heads together. Were I were gone to the line of this new king, I would not prophesy so. I think the policy of that purpose made more in the marriage than the love of the parties. I think so too. But you shall find the band that seems to tie their friendship together will be the very strangler of their enemy. Octavia is of a holy, cold, and still conversation. Who would not have his wife so? Not that he himself is not so, which is Mark Antony. He will own to his Egyptian dish again. Shell the size of Octavia blow up the fire in Caesar, and as I said before, that which is strength of their enmity shall prove the immediate author of their variance. Antony will use his affection where it is he married, but his occasion. Thus it may be. Come, sir, bring your boy. I have a husband. I should take it so. We have used our throats. Um, this scene depicts the history and it carries us along in time but it offers us little for the things that we're doing the characters are not developed much further, but they do remain consistent psychologically and astrologically. Antony is, is as challenging as he has always been and as a Mars-Jupiter man can be. And both Antony and Pompey speak in a high-blown Jupiter-Mars way, and they place honor above everything, including wisdom. Caesar has very little to say, but what he says is pointed. He doesn't need to talk. He's got everything his way now, and he's parsimonious. Uh, saying any more wouldn't uh, do him any good. 
That's very Saturnian. He doesn't need to say any more. You know, Barbus continues to speak out of turn, and he always speaks with martial values. When Eno Barbus and Minas meet together, we have a little bit of Mars on Mars conversation. First they challenge each other, then they each boast, then they respect each other, and then they finally have man talk about their generals. They show that they can see what's coming down, uh, things that Antony perhaps can't see, partly because of his personal involvement and partly because of his Jupiterian overconfidence. He thinks he's going to be able to go back to Cleopatra and get away with it. Underlings often have a more objective view because they don't have anything involved. Their humble position has them open to seeing things as they are and to intuiting the truth. They don't have any pride to defend. If we look at this scene, and most of the scenes where we have all of the principles of the world involved in it, it's pretty barren. This play has almost no poetry in it, and it has extremely few mythical allusions, and all of this seems to be intentional. It's describing the world of politics, which is a pretty bleak world. It makes somebody like me wonder why anybody in the world would ever want to go into a world with no poetry and no mythology. Uh, that's that's the way it goes. All right, we're down to the last scene, I guess. And Millie kicks off. Oh, this is hard reading, too. As they pinch one another by the disposition, he cries out, No more! Reconciles them to his entreaty and himself to the drink. But it raises the greater war between him and his discretion. Why? This Aristus has a name in great emancipation. I had a right. I had a right to be a police that will do me no service as a partisan. I could not be. Severe and not to be seen to move in on the holes where the eyes should be, which quickly disaster shoots. As do they serve a tall denial, let me scale in a pyramid, or by the height of us in a mean, and work our place in hollow. I admire the spell and more promise. Oh, I am not so well as I should be, but I'll I'll narrow out. Not that you have slept, I fear you will be in for the night. I have heard that Chaldees, uh, the embassies, are very goodly things. Without contradiction, I have heard that. I'll take a word. They and my lord. Of its own color, too. This is Spencer. The soul in the ears of it are wet. The 
this deception satisfy? Will this description satisfy him? The alpha ame yuntum is the very attitude. Go home, say, I am. Tell me of that. Do I? Do as I do you. Where is this cup of cold water? These quicksands, Lepidus, keep off them for you sink. Wilt thou be Lord of all the world? What says thou? Wilt thou be Lord of the whole world? That's twice. <laughs> How should that be? So that the same, as though thou shouldst be poor, I am now to assume the whole world. Hast thou done well? No. Ah, this thou should have done and have not spoken on it. In me tis villainy, in thee it had been good service. Thou must know, tis not my profit that does lead my honor. My honor it, mine honor it. Repent that ere thy tongue hath so betrayed thine act. Being undone, I should have found it afterwards well done, but must condemn it now. Desist and drink. For this I'll never follow thy call fortunes more. Who seeks and will not take when once to the offer shall never find it more. This help the Methodus. Bear him ashore. I'll pledge it for him. I'll pay. Here's to thee, Menas. What about this drug? Bill shall the cup be his. The third part of the world is drunk. Would it were all that it might go on wheels. Come, let's all take hands till the conquering wine has steeped our sense in soft and delicate leaf.
scene uh, begins on the same note in which the previous scene ended. Underlings are commenting on the behavior of those they serve. You look at the first, when the servants are speaking, you see the language is not easy. And uh, it almost seems inconsistent for servants to have such complex language. The reason for it is, is I think Shakespeare is trying to introduce more humor into this very serious play. And if you read over that section again and look at the notes, you'll see that almost every statement there has two meanings, and each of the two meanings uh, is a joke about drunkenness. They're describing what takes place before we see what takes place. That's something we saw in A Winter's Tale, and the description is often more powerful than seeing it directly acted out. Part of this is new to the concentration, the abbreviated concentration that when somebody relates something, they can't tell everything that their eye sees, and they tell as much as they can, and it gets concentrated by their observation. And part of it is due to the fact that there is interpretation. Sometimes we look at things and we don't understand what they mean, but if somebody relates to us what's going on, in their very act of relating, it is given meaning for us. This whole scene is, for me, difficult. I don't think this kind of scene is an accident, but I am by no means certain that I would dare attribute it to Shakespeare. But it seems to me that a mind that had such clarity as Shakespeare's had probably did have more intoxication and stupefaction in gluttony. There is a school of humor, of the psychology of humor, that holds that we laugh when we have tension relief. We laugh at the silly stupidity of the drunk compared to the waking state because it's happening to him, and it's not happening to us. In the same way that we laugh at somebody that else that gets a pie in the face and is in hurt, and it's not us. Sometimes we can laugh ourselves into tears. This is something like that. We usually sow the seeds of our downfall in the high stage of the cycle. If we are down, we are humbled, and we're struggling with retribution from earlier deeds, and we're just fighting to keep our head above water. But when we get back on top again, what do we do? We celebrate. And we celebrate as we think it is because of ourselves that we are on top, not just because it's part of the cycle. We treat ourselves, and the treat that we give to ourselves is actually a punishment. Gluttony, intoxication, are punishments, they're not rewards. I don't know if Shakespeare would be trying to say it, but I'm trying to say it. Because, uh, you know, even just reading this is not pleasant to me. What is ironic about all of this is, is that I find myself in agreement with Caesar. <laughs> I'm not at all like Caesar, and I can't find anything usually to be in uh, agreement with him. But in this, as far as sobriety, I certainly am with him. What Antony says about the pyramid being used to mark the height of the flood is true. The three large pyramids put together were used as a large theodolite that was used to divide the land up among the different farmers. What is amazing is that Shakespeare knew all of this and could just 
brought in in one sentence in a play. Isaac Newton, who lived a few years after Shakespeare, uh, had a suspicion of it, but you know, he just could put it in the word just like that. Around line 27, Lepidus speaks of the sun engendering life into snakes and crocodiles in the mud. It's not clear what he's saying there. It is clear that the sun is the source of life of everything on earth. It is also true that some species use the heat of sunlight to hatch their eggs. Like sea turtles are like that. They lay their eggs on sand and the sun heats them and uh, germinates the eggs. The most famous Egyptian case is that uh, dung beetles, scarabs, lay their eggs in dung and then they roll them up into balls and the heat from the sun on the balls and the uh, breakdown, the heat of rock in the dung uh, heats the eggs of the scarab and uh, the eggs are germinated. I don't know if crocodile eggs or snake eggs are heated by the sun. you know anything about that, Mark? They are. It may also be a, uh, an allusion to estivation, which the Egyptians surely knew about. Estivation is when something like a crocodile uh, goes to sleep under the mud in the dry season, and then uh, when the water returns, it comes out and gives life to it again. Uh, Antony describes a crocodile to Lepidus. It's a very funny description, and it's a description that is in perfect character. It is the extreme, almost the epitome of abstraction. It is not a thing that is concrete in Anthony's description of the crocodile. Neither size, nor color, nor means of locomotion, nor food. It's all abstract. And that's exactly what you'd expect from a Jupiterian character, most likely a Sagittarian Jupiterian. Uh, interesting form of humor. I've never tried it in my life, but I'm itching to try it now, so I may look for uh, uh, a circumstance in which I can do that. <laughs> Earlier this evening, we talked about how the lower nature, or the false ego, or the pseudo-self operates in the cover of the unconscious operates in the dark. We're in the dark about its existence and its intents. The spiritual self operates from the unconscious also, though its actions are not hidden by stealth. It's actually quite straightforward. But it is the subtlety of its light that keeps it hidden from us, and we're only just beginning to awaken to that light. We've also said that the spirit is itself awakening, and it's awakening to its own spiritual dignity and to its own divine rulership. The way that that happens is by enlightenment itself. It is not a mysterious process at all. We see it very frequently. When it occurs, all we have to do is see something for what it is and its real meaning and our relationship to it and it to us is immediately changed just in the seeing of the truth of it, that kind of enlightenment. If we take note of something good, something benign and beneficent, something that could be, that very act of seeing it, that light of knowing, 
is the beginning and eventual accomplishment of that good. If it is something foul and something evil, and we see it deeply enough and clearly enough, that very act of seeing is how we overcome it. There is something about the nature of the spirit, of the self, that it cannot knowingly do evil. That spirit in the region of ideational thought, where we get the idea, where the lights turn on, is benign. This is why Jupiter is called the greater benefic. This is how enlightenment takes place. It even takes place in such silly little things as grammar. If we once note that we're using words wrong, we don't have to practice using them the right way. Because once we see it, it's changed. So this interaction between Pompeii and Venice, or Venus, is an object lesson from Pompeii, the Jupiterian Pompeii, on how the light of consciousness overcomes evil. He said, if you hadn't told me this, it would have been to my advantage. But now that I know this, and now that I see this, I cannot give assent to it. It's very clever of you, but you have to desist. This is what we employ every day in our lives. If we live by the truth, or if we see the truth of something, in that light of knowing, we cannot do evil. That's how it works. All the rest at the end where they sing and hold hands and dance together, that's not spiritual unity. That's a kind of intoxicated sentimentalism. It's a resort to ignorance at another level. What we want is light, always more light. And that's it. That's not going to be another act. Great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but I may not have a lot to say. Yeah, we did pretty well. Good. Oh, I know. Yeah, I like it. I really like what we're doing because when you when people are reading, you can hear the appreciation as they're reading it and, and liking it. I like that a lot. Ha, ha, ha.